and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I'm joined by the man who taught NYCFC how to defend. <laughs> His name is Taylor Rockwell. Hello. Hello just Matarita. I'm the only, <laughs> that, that was like my uh, my star pupil until last night. Well, I would say our, ti- everything he knows. <laughs> our timing is as bad as um, a Chino header. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we were here to review mm-hmm. um, last night's MLS playoff games. We're, we're going to review NYCFC versus Toronto. I guess spoiler alert for what happened there, mm-hmm. um, and Seattle RSL. But we kind of ran out of time. Yeah. The good news is we're going to be talking to Joe Lowry tomorrow morning. True. So we will also review the other two MLS playoff games, which are Atlanta v. Philly mm-hmm. and El Trafico. Mm-hmm. You thought maybe I'd forgotten, didn't you? No, I was confident. Yeah? I was confident you I'm put glad, it I'm glad one of us was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so we'll talk about like all four of those games, get Joe's thoughts on some of the tactical variations, the adjustments, what yeah. happened, the craziness. We're assuming there'll be craziness tonight as well, so we'll get a <laughs> thoughts on that craziness too. Um, but today, mm-hmm. we're going to do some more listener questions not so many u.s men's national team ones because right. that that well actually that well isn't dry mm-hmm. but we have gone very deep into that well we have we have it's time to climb out yes <laughs> and then we found other people who were maybe even deeper in that well <laughs> good luck to them down there yeah um, we're gonna start with some mls questions all right are you ready for the first one i believe i am it's from ken ackerson mm-hmm. ken ackerson wants to know why don't we see more americans going to the championship from MLS. Right. This is an interesting question, right? It is, which turned out to be kind of a sad question or sad answer, I guess, yeah. because my sort of assumption was that players going abroad want to go to a top flight and the championship uh, is like aggressive and physical and it's long and it's a slog. Daryl pointed out like that's kind of how it used to be. It's less so now. You yeah. still have some teams It's all playing. Bielsa-y now. Yeah. There you go. It's all <laughs> Bielsa-y. Uh, and so with that in mind, we looked a little deeper and we realized you actually don't have that many MLS players going two other leagues to begin with. Yeah. And certainly like in terms of top flight leagues, it's at least if you look at like the last couple transfer windows, it's few and far between in terms of you have a player like Miguel Amaron, who everybody yeah. points to. Aside from Get that, Newcastle. it's a lot of younger players going to like for decent sums to larger clubs, but they're going there to develop. So you've yeah. got Zach Steffen, Tyler Adams, Chris Richards, uh, Alfonso Davies, even uh, Chaturo Odunze. He goes to Leicester City as a goalkeeper. He's 17 years old, though. So I think it's younger players. Is he players. American? Uh, yeah. He's, he's in the U17 national team right Here's now. Here's a problem, though. Mm. Uh, I think of three of the players you just listed, it's not based on a random sort of look at MLS and, oh, I like that player. Let's yeah. get him, right? Tyler Adams went from New York Red Bulls to Red Bull Leipzig, mm-hmm. or excuse me, Russian Ball Sport Leipzig. Mm-hmm. But you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. part of a pipeline. Um, FC Dallas and Bayern Munich have that mm-hmm. connection, right? So Chris Richards going to Bayern Munich is part of the yep. the weird setup they have, yeah. right? The Alfonso Davies one, I guess, is an outlier in terms of genuinely was just a player we looked at and yeah. decided, okay, we like him. And maybe yeah. Zach Steffen was too, but there's also a chance because you have NYCFC and you've got City Football Group like affiliated yeah. there that maybe there's sort of a connection that they're aware of what Steffen does or how he might affect the American market if he's playing yeah. for Man City, what have you. But it's still younger players going and then being loaned out or being developed by these bigger clubs. It's not so many people going to play right now. This was a surprise to me because yeah. I really thought, oh, Almiron, Adams, Alfonso mm-hmm. Davies, like, MLS is a selling league now and it kind of is because yeah. there's these high profile sales. But that well is very shallow. Mm-hmm. It's a really fancy well at the top, but when you try to get water from deep down, there's not much there. There's really not. I was really surprised to learn this. Yeah, and so you get a lot of players going to, or a few, at least a few players going to Scotland, going to Scandinavia. Yeah. You've got some like Belgium, some Netherlands in there, some Brazil. But for the most part, you're even part, making it sound like more than it is. Like, even for those yeah. transfers, you're reaching back a couple of years, mm-hmm. right? Like Ian Hark's going to Scotland was yeah. a while ago now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like you don't have quite as many. Perry players Kitchen's going. come back. Yes, that's a good call. So yeah, I think that's that's the answer is you don't have as many uh, players from Major League Soccer and specifically Americans yeah. going to these leagues to play right away. It seems like th- at this point it's about bringing in younger players who can develop within the system yeah. so then these teams can play them a couple years from now, not right away. And maybe it's because if you're a championship team, I consider the championship actually a really competitive league and I know it's a very well-paid league, so it is an attractive destination, but it's also kind of a high-quality destination. I'm not sure championship teams are going to look at MLS mm-hmm. and be like, oh, yeah, we'll take that guy. He'll definitely be able to come here and help us win promotion from the championship. Yeah. I just think basically there's not enough respect for MLS for that to be able to happen. No, he, and- isn't Jack, Jack Harrison at Leeds yeah. was part of the NYCFC 
to Man City pipeline and then loan to Leeds. Yeah, because when we initially, uh, keep that in mind, because when we initially got this question, we were both like, but there's tons of players playing in the championship. Yeah. What are you talking about? There's tons Dwayne of Dwayne Holmes, Matt Miazga. Yeah, but then you look at the players who were there, Jack Harrison as an example, that is a player who's essentially vouched for by a Premier League club that employs him. Yes. And it's a lot of players being loaned to championship clubs after they've been transferred to another team. Yeah, Matt or, Miazga, Chelsea to yeah, Reading, right? Exactly, yeah. or sold there. After maybe things didn't work out for them, mm-hmm. but even like Dwayne Holmes, we look, we'll look back and realize like no, he's just developed in the English system. So he moved he to England really when qualify. he was four. Yeah. So he's basically English, right? Mm-hmm. He's like, I think American dad, English mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't have as many like going to most of the places in Europe where you want to see players going in their prime to compete. Yeah, which is a more of an issue than I realized, and and really more than anything solidifies that idea that like that 24 to 28-year-old age range really is a problem for the U.S. right now. But even younger, I'm mm-hmm. now worried about Because before answering Ken's question, I would have said, yeah, MLS is becoming a mm-hmm. selling league. All these players are going to Europe. Um, I, I'm now a little worried. I'm now going to stop saying that MLS is a selling league mm-hmm. because other leagues sell a lot more to other places. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I mean, you can't sell five players and be like, yep, we're a selling league now. <laughs> it's got to be a few more than that. I if think. you open a business and only yeah. sell five products in a, in yeah. a year, you're probably going to close that. I sell five in one window. Yeah. That's how it works. <laughs> Another question? Yeah. All right. Joshua Bishop. Mm-hmm. Why isn't the supporter shield valued more? Yeah. So I'm going to take this at face value and say because there are playoffs and because there's an MLS Cup. Yeah, it really is that yep. simple, right? Mm-hmm. I think it is impossible to – because there's a longer version of Josh's question where – Joshua's question, excuse me, where he says like in other leagues, the league title is the big thing. Mm-hmm. Why isn't that so in MLS? And I think your answer is the – it's the absolute supporter shield killer – is the fact that there are playoffs directly afterwards. Yeah. Right? I, I would argue that... It's not the final level. There's still a big bus to beat. Right. It's MLS Cup. Yeah, exactly. And so, within a month, I would say, though, that this season is probably the most value it's had that I can remember, simply because single elimination, yeah. you no longer have the uh, like lower-ranked team plays home first, then you have home field advantage okay, in the yeah, final yeah. leg. Now it is the case that if you have the best record, theoretically, unless you're New York uh, NYCFC, <laughs> then... Well, to be fair, they didn't get to play at home. They did not. That's very true. Uh, but then theoretically you do have home field advantage which gives you the advantage which allows you to potentially host MLS Cup which has always been the case but with more games spread out over two legs it made it a little bit harder yep. so I'd say slimming down the playoffs has made the supporter shield more valuable but, but even it's then, not that valuable even then it's only more valuable because of uh, the context and relationship to what happens in the playoffs right? right and I think as long as there are playoffs the supporter shield is never going to supersede the playoffs because mm-hmm. the, the playoffs come next right yeah. and we can talk up the supporter shield as much as we want but until it's the only thing it's not going to it's not going to be that highly valued mm-hmm. right? yeah I, I mean I, I think at this point I still put it slightly above the US Open Cup strange as that might be but the US Open Cup has so many weird variations for who comes in when and how much teams are prioritizing yeah. and some teams will just be like we're playing in our academy like we don't care about this at all we're focused on the regular season and with that in mind I still say now it's two I probably would have put it at three a couple years ago so okay. at least it's moved up that much but it's never going to beat the like the final game of the playoffs. And uh, we assume that the League's Cup is numero uno, right? Oh, yeah, of course. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> that's like, that's miles ahead. Miles ahead. Uh, one more one question. One day, Taylor. One day it will be. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, Brendan Masser asks, given Extra Time Radio's Chad Marshall theory, when will we see MLS teams spend big on center backs and will it work? We weren't as familiar. We could kind of take a guess as to what the yeah. theorem was. We asked Bobby Warshaw, Robert Warshaw, excuse me. Mr. Robert Warshaw. I apologize. We should add, add Esquire in just because it <laughs> sounds better. Uh, and basically their idea is that like Chad Marshall – is such a good defender, and maybe the rest of MLS doesn't have wait, many wait, good defenders. When you said you were researching what the Chad Marshall theorem was, yeah. did you just ask Bobby? Yeah. Oh, I thought oh, yeah. you like, no. went and did oh, some no. research. I did. I looked it up, and it just kept being like the title of like like parts of the title of different Extra Time episodes, yeah. but there was no description to tell me what it was, and I wasn't going to listen, so <laughs> no, then I texted we're Bobby. We're not giving Weeby the downloads? No. I spent three minutes trying to figure <laughs> it out, and then I just texted Bobby, and the idea is that basically you we can should put, We should click play and stop just to give him one download for it. Nah, I'm fine with it. Uh, <laughs> the idea is you can put Chad Marshall on any team in MLS, and that automatically makes them a playoff team. Because Be- defenses aren't that strong, and, exactly. and, and, a, and Chad Marshall makes every defense better? Exactly. Yeah. I believe that is the theorem. Okay. Okay, so that's the theorem, and Brendan's mm-hmm. question is, when will we see MLS teams spend big on centre-backs, and will it work? Mm-hmm. I can answer the second part first and say it definitely would work. It would. Yeah. And again, we didn't get to review the NYCFC game um, on today's show, but that Chanel header backwards, mm-hmm. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I mean, oh yeah. I mean, there's plenty of center. I mean, I would say both of Portland's kind of makeshift center backs are reasons yeah. why they didn't make it as far as they did last season. Yep. And last season is part of the reason why they look so shaky at times. Yes, I think, and which is strange because of the few like DP center backs we've seen. Portland had one of them in Liam Ridgewell. Yes. And I'm going to say, not coincidentally, while he was there, they won MLS Cup. Yep. Yeah, and I'm not sure there've been that many DP mm-hmm. center backs, right? But once you do have a style, I think MLS teams. I, I am more. sure there have not been many. <laughs> Is what I will say to that. Do you think it's more like MLS teams try to look into having a high quality centre back that they're not paying very much mm-hmm. and stick with that for as long as they can? I mean, I think we've we've talked about this. I think with Alexi Lalas at some point, and his and his rationale was simple. It's like you don't sell tickets with a defender; you sell tickets with names, and yep. especially attacking names. If you go to the the skills challenge that happened uh, this summer when we were in Orlando for All Star, yeah, yeah. you see a lot of centre backs out there. You <laughs> see a lot of creative playmakers and goal scorers because that's what people want, and those tend to be the names that will bring people in. Yeah, even. Like a DP. So that's why the money gets spent, the DP money, and even the yeah. TAM money all gets spent on attacking players um, Yeah, who maybe bring the, bring the fans in, yeah, not exactly. head balls away. The, yeah, exactly. Because the only <laughs> Bring other... the fans in, not keep the ball out. Right. I mean, because like, if you look at the other DP players, like a Tim Howard, for example, you're, like, you're bringing him back certainly past his prime, and I think part of that is because he is so beloved and has such name recognition yeah. that you'll probably get some people to come out just to say they got yeah, to see yeah. Tim Howard before he retired. I think that is true. With center it's backs, a special case, right? It's Tim yeah. Howard. Yeah. Like, I feel like there's only a few center backs in the world that would make me want to go to a game just to like, ooh, okay, they're playing. Ooh, like, all right, who are they? Oh, Sergio Ramos, for sure. Sergio Ramos? Oh, yeah, I don't like Sergio Ramos, but Yeah, don't yeah, get me but wrong. that's part of the appeal, but, right? Like, you know he's going to be a warrior and, like, score corner goals maybe after, you know, like, maybe some other things have yeah, happened. Yeah. Then he'll come out and score goals. He's going to cause trouble. Yes. There'll be some villainy. Yes. Some enjoyable villainy. Yes. Some <laughs> allegedly Milan medical facility, if you, if oh, you take yeah, what I'm getting yeah. at here. But, yes, uh, I think Sergio Ramos would be one. Like He mm. does come back from injuries very quickly. He does, doesn't he? Slightly odd. <laughs> uh, like, Maybe Gerard Piquet. I don't know if he's in that. Like, he probably isn't, but maybe that's because I'm a Man United fan and he left and it makes me sad. Uh, uh, I don't know. Like, I guess, like, Van Dyke, if Van Dyke ever moved over. Absolutely. Yeah, he'd be an absolute joke. Because, honestly, you could sell that is, as, yeah. come and see the best defender in the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even though, by the time he moved there, it would be like, from 10 years ago. <laughs> come and see the guy who used to be the <laughs> exactly. best defender in exactly. the world. Exactly. But I think, like, you have a harder time <laughs> selling those tickets because... Even though those players are probably going to make you better, I also think that unless you're a team that is going to be decidedly defensive, yeah. you're going to kind of build your defense as you can and then put that money into the attack so you have a stronger attack. Like I'm, if Jose Mourinho came in and managed, that's where I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> to see like a DP as a center back and a DP as a holding midfielder. Okay, so we definitely think it would work. Yeah. Um, and there's even evidence uh, beyond Liam Ridgewell mm-hmm. that just came to me that Ikapara, mm-hmm. Minnesota like, went after him. They made the playoffs for the first time, hosted a playoff game yeah. for the mm-hmm. first time, right? So it, it absolutely does work. But the big question is, when will MLS teams spend big on centre-backs? And the only answer I can come up with is when the salary cap is really, really large and yeah. there's, lots of, there's enough money to uh, spend big enough that you can get some exciting attacking names, but then there's enough money left over to pay centre-backs well. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, it's only when there's going to be enough money left over will you be able to spend it on centre-backs. Yeah, I think you've answered this because for me... Quite proud of myself. I was kind of trying to figure it out. I was trying to figure out if it was like a chicken or the egg situation of like, is it the case? Like, like the the Timbers spending money on Liam Ridgewell. The answer to that question is evolution, by the way. Okay, Um, the like the Timbers spending money on Liam Ridgewell at the time. I was like, really? Like that's a you want to. Okay, like that's yeah. the DP you want to go for, and it seemed weird to me. So my answer would be like, when it doesn't seem weird to spend money on a center back is when we'll see it happen more. Yeah, but I think the only way- some like trailblazing team will do it, and then another team. But will see, that's do the it. thing. It's like, yeah. but then like in order for it not to be weird, teams have to do it. So that's the chicken or the egg thing. And I think the answer is like yeah. when teams start to embrace that when there's more money and they can actually go out and buy those types of players yep. and not have to then look at their forward line and be like, well. Hopefully we score some goals, fingers crossed. <laughs> and honestly, it will improve the quality of mm-hmm. the league. It will improve the quality of Major League Soccer mm-hmm. when there's just high-quality defending. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like maybe, so. you, maybe you'll see fewer goals, mm-hmm. but you will definitely turn the TV on and see a higher-quality product. Yeah. And I think you'll be able to feel that. I think you will. I think the only other thing that would probably facilitate it is, like, I think there right now is an idea, maybe I'm just spitballing here, but, like, or I definitely am, but, like, there's an idea, I think, that defenses we'll require... We'll wipe the desk off afterwards. That's fair. Defenses require systems. 
Uh, whereas yeah. like goal scorers can just make something happen. They can just come in there and have a, a moment of magic, and they're going to score goals. Zlatan can just score from midfield or score a bike or score a header or whatever. Yeah. And so if you're bringing in a defender, I think with that comes the idea of like, okay, but now we've got to have a system built around them, and we've got to make sure it kind of benefits them. Yeah. And maybe you don't have that as much with forwards, even though you should, because <laughs> you still need a system to allow your forward to be consistently good in consistently deadly positions. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. Um, all right, more questions yeah. to answer. But first... But first We've got some advice for you. We sure do. Um, Halloween is on the mm-hmm. way, but don't be scared. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Um, don't be a little scared. It's, it's maybe time to break out the rubber spiders, the fake cobwebs, and the jack-o'-lanterns. But if you've got a family, you might be dealing with something a little scarier. Shopping for life insurance. Mm-hmm. And if the idea of looking for life insurance intimidates you, try policygenius.com because you don't know how scary those trick-or-treaters could be. Maybe they're going to be really scary. You get so scared, you get scared to death. And if you don't have life insurance, it's going to be a problem. So you're saying you've got to get life insurance before Halloween. I mean, obviously. Yeah, yeah. To, yeah. so that you can survive the night. Yes, plus you've got all of the What if obvious... it's like a purge Halloween? <laughs> that, that would be troubling. You've got the obvious urban legends about, you know, like drugs put into candy, which has definitely never happened, but is a thing that people did to yeah. terrify people in the suburbs. Yeah, isn't the correct answer to that is why would people give away perfectly good drugs exactly <laughs> exactly and like also like the apple with a razor blade first of all anyone giving you an apple don't trust them that's not how halloween yeah. works but second of all that's again trick. like if there's a razor blade sticking out of it life tip don't eat it not a good <laughs> idea um which will also probably kill you in which case you want life insurance and policy genius is the easy way to shop for life insurance online in minutes you can compare quotes from top insurers to find your best price it is much less scary than a razor blade in an apple i would agree with that um, and once you Apply Policy Genius, the team will handle all the paperwork and the red tape. Policy Genius makes life insurance easy, but mm-hmm. they can also help you find home insurance, auto insurance, and disability insurance, all kinds of other insurances. All of those insurances can be intimidating, can be a little bit scary. So again, Policy Genius making that easy is very much appreciated. You can just sit at home and eat all the candy that was meant for the trick-or-treaters who didn't show up. <laughs> that way you can uh, spend your time on more worthwhile pursuits. We've missed an opportunity here to, to make the, uh, the parallel that Investing in a defender. Yeah. It's the same as investing really in life is. insurance. Yeah. It is. Okay, that this was is, probably the better one to go this with. This is the yeah. Chad Marshall theorem. <laughs> so this October, uh, incorporate the Chad Marshall theorem. <laughs> Take the scariness out of buying life insurance with Policy Genius. Go to policygenius.com, get quotes, and apply in minutes. You can do the whole thing on your phone right now in minutes. Policy Genius, the easy way to compare and buy center backs. No, the easy <laughs> way to compare and buy life insurance. Thank you to policygenius.com for sponsoring today's show. Agreed. Uh, next question. Question comes from Raghav Gupta. Why is there not as much movement of players between MLS teams? If you're a good player for a lower tier Premier League team, you'll probably move somewhere in the Premier League as a next step. Doesn't seem the same in MLS. I think there are multiple answers mm-hmm. to this. I think the first one is just the weird straight up thing where you can't just say, I'll give you this much money for yep. that player. Mm-hmm. You have to do a whole trade of like, I'll give you uh, this right back that we're not using plus these draft picks plus some general allocation money plus some targeted mm-hmm. allocation money yep. and then you've got to make sure that you've got enough room um, on your salary cap to acquire this player <laughs> you, it gets very complicated you just saying that made Rude Hillett quit LAFC <laughs> again yeah. <laughs> just that explanation he was like I just want to make sure I quit for sure so yeah it's basically just that transfers are hard yeah. um, both like anywhere in Major League Soccer yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's definitely a part of it I would say the like limited free agency factors into it as well because yeah. you like once your contract is done if the team doesn't renew you you don't just get to go sign wherever you want unless you have like certain contingencies met yeah otherwise you're and like what you're back into like a draft where people can pick you and mm-hmm. and then it still isn't much like freedom of movement but the biggest thing in my opinion is just that there's parity and you don't have those kind of dynastic teams that you know are always going to be the most alluring like yeah. lafc is alluring right now atlanta is a very attractive team right now yeah it stands to reason they will continue to be but, but it's, it's not, not because, it's not the same right as if right. you like if you're danny elvez and you play for severe and mm-hmm. you play really well yeah. like you're obviously this like magnificent player mm-hmm. you're always going to then drift towards Barcelona right. or Real Madrid mm-hmm. same in the Premier League right you play really well for Leicester you're Harry Maguire eventually you're like alright but now I want to go play for Manchester United right. yeah. you know what I'm saying yeah. there just isn't that same thing yet in Major League Soccer maybe there will be one day but not yeah, right now but I, but I think that that sort of is the appeal of Major League Soccer I know a lot of people hate that a lot of people think it should be like freedom and everybody can do whatever they want and you can have gigantic teams then you kind of run to the baseball model of 
every now I mean, the Royals are good, or at least were good a couple years ago, but for the longest time, Kansas City was the team that was like 15 wins and 140 losses, or whatever <laughs> the numbers would be. So, like, you, I kind of enjoy that you don't have that. You don't have that sort of, well, he was good for Columbus for two seasons, but he's definitely going to New York now because yeah. that's what happens. Do you think we'll ever see it? Because I do feel like we're moving towards... Um Definitely, the the uh, the graph trends towards teams having a bit more freedom, right? Like another DP mm-hmm. gets added, and like Arthur Blank spends all the money. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it is possible that as things loosen up more and more and more, and there are certain owners and certain teams that are determined to spend more and more money, and a team like Atlanta has a seventy thousand seat stadium, that really could end up being a destination. I think. Again, thinking on the fly here, I think a a factor that will limit that as a possibility is expansion. Because as teams come online, you're paying this massive fee that continues to increase. And I think expansion fee, yeah, there's probably an element of like, well, we just paid. You know, a couple of years from now, it's probably going to be like five hundred million dollars to get into the league. We don't then want to have to spend more money. Like, no, we were guaranteed that we would be kind of a balanced system. I think only when they stop expanding, and then you've got to look for ways to kind of increase. Uh, like the relevance of the league and increase the appeal. Maybe that's where they really, really loosen it up. But I think for as long as they can, they're going to try to keep it as fair as they can. Well, it depends, what the, owner, quotes, it depends the what the owners are like when yes. they come in, right? Yeah. There might be expansion owners who are like, I want to spend the money. I want to mm-hmm. make this the best possible thing, yeah. right? And then there are other teams. Let's just yeah, say. there are other teams. <laughs> but then there are also other teams like the Galaxy who are just like, yeah, well, you know, we're going to have seven DPs. What are you going to do about it? Like, we'll force that hand. And I think it will probably also take teams sort of pushing that through. The fact that Christian Pavone plays for LA Galaxy is a sign of how they're able to sort yeah. of maneuver things financially to make stuff work. I, I kind of like that the Galaxy pushed the oh, envelope. Yeah. Yeah. I do too. I know, I know fans of other teams don't like it because mm-hmm. they feel like the Galaxy gets special treatment. But if the Galaxy hadn't, for example gone after David Beckham, we mm-hmm. wouldn't even have DPs at all. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it is the cleverness of the Galaxy that, like, that is their branding, that is their reputation of, like, oh, they're going to push stuff, they're going to try to sign people. Like, oh, the Galaxy with their five DPs. And it's just <laughs> sort of like, like, what? No, like, they're they're abusing the system, but it becomes, like, their identity, so it's sort of okay. It's weird. It's they, even, they tried to sign a third Dos Santos brother who wasn't even good. <laughs> they just wanted to have him on there. Frank. Frank, Frank Dos Santos. Frank Dos Santos, yes. yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> it really didn't work out that well. But, yeah, I think it is uh, – parody is a big aspect of it uh, combined with the kind of – Complicated limited, transfer system. Exactly, right? yeah. yeah. I think those two things combine. All right. Uh, so one final thing I'd like to add on mm-hmm. this is what I would love to see is a system where MLS teams could buy players from, say – the USL Championship that would make sense. or USL League One. Mm-hmm. We still don't see that happening. I really would love there to be more of a, um, basically a, a market system, um, some capitalism mm-hmm. in American soccer where lower league teams can produce players and they can then receive financial reward from them from the big major league soccer teams. Yeah. That just doesn't happen right now. Yeah, like, and I don't want to, like, I don't even know much about like how the kickers, our, our local team, the yeah. USL League One team, like how their front office works, how the contracts work. So I don't even want to like say like this is what they're doing. But we don't hear about them selling players for $200,000 to uh, the LA Galaxy, right? No, what we do hear about instead is them having to employ people on like one-year contracts because they, you know, the, it's it's a it's a budget business league one that you've yeah. got to kind of find ways to operate relatively cheaply because otherwise you're going to lose money and then suddenly Lansing Ignite happens. And so yeah. if you were able to know that like if this player performs really well, maybe an MLS team is going to come in and buy him for 50 grand or 100 grand and that's yeah. a huge part of your operating expenses, then you're yeah. going to sign those players to longer deals and help develop them a little bit more. What if Lansing could have sold one of their center backs because suddenly in this imaginary world, this yep. utopia we're creating center mm-hmm. backs are really highly valued. Obviously. If uh, <laughs> Lansing could Worth have, noting that Daryl is a center back. <laughs> <laughs> Lansing could have sold one of their yep. center backs to an MLS team and that would have met their operating budget and then the owner would have been like and now we keep going for, yeah. for 2020 if you had like a specified budget for signing lower league players if like every team got an extra million dollars to sign or like five hundred thousand dollars to sign that's a brilliant idea to spend on transfer fees from lamb. usl teams lamb lower league allocation money so it's oh, lamb. lamb yeah <laughs> there it is yeah love it but like if and the, you say how did you get that play you say on the lamb exactly see perfect <laughs> there we go but like if joe gallardo has the season he had for the this kickers, is a, a talented attacker young attacker for the return yeah. Kickers. Used to play for U17 national team, yeah. I believe, like and was the kicker's best player, I think, by far this season. Like you're like the kickers know he's going to be great, know he'll probably have some value, so they're going to want to keep him and develop him. But there are other younger players who maybe you play regularly, they develop a bit more. 
but you don't know if you can afford them at the end of the season. And so maybe development isn't as much in your mind as winning right now. If you know that you could get that lamb, yeah. then you might develop some more players. Financial incentive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cook up some lamb. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, next question <laughs> is from Greyhair Gaming. Um, Greyhair Gaming asks, in your review of the Canada debacle, this is the CONCACAF Nations League game, you two, that's me and you, mm-hmm. talked about wanting to see a consistent 11 and less rotation. Mm-hmm. I think we actually talked about just wanting to see like a pair of centre-backs play together. That'd be nice. Yeah. Right, some consistency. Um, Greyhair says, this seems to be the opposite of your views around Arena because we complained that he didn't rotate for the Trinidad and Tobago game and we paid the price. So he asks, have your views changed or are the situations different with Berhalter trying to install his system and needing consistency versus Arena just needing fresh legs to see out a boring draw. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's the second part. Is that, can that just be my answer? Yeah, I mean, it basically is, right? <laughs> yeah. The Trinidad game in October 2017 mm-hmm. was a very specific thing where we just played that game against, I believe, Panama and mm-hmm. beat them handily, gone down to Curva, and the, the field was really heavy with water. It was always going to be draining on the legs. And Bruce Arena fielded the exact same 11. Mm-hmm. And guess what? They looked really tired. They really did. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, some rotation in that situation would have been really smart. Yeah. But in, in the Greg Berhalter situation, we're saying that essentially there hasn't been enough time for a centre-back partnership to form. We, that was the example we used because there was just, there's just constantly a lot of chopping and changing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, one's about fresh legs and one's about establishing a partnership. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think also part of our frustration or like a, a difference maker here for me at least was that Arena was coming in to sort of get us to the World Cup and he had, and he had said, I believe, even before this game that it was like, we're going to kind of stick with the people who I know can get us to the World Cup and then once we qualify, ha ha ha, once we qualify, that's when he was going to kind of experiment yeah. and change things. That would have been the Western McKenney call up. Yeah, and he, that would have been lovely. And I do sort of believe him, even though I still do not love Bruce Arena for the way yeah. it's happened. Whereas with Burhalter, I think part of our frustration with sort of the rotations and the changes is that I understand it is it is his like sort of responsibility as a coach to not give stuff away. He doesn't want to throw players under the bus. He doesn't want to say like, yeah, this guy sucked. We're not going to play him anymore. That doesn't really help the relationship. It doesn't build a lot of trust. Yeah. But it's also that we haven't heard a lot about why this didn't work, why that didn't work. Like one of the only players I think we have an ex- an explanation for is Kellen Acosta when he was sent home in January. And it was like, I believe it was like he wasn't fit enough and it just didn't yeah. work. But aside from that, we don't get a lot of why things didn't work or what kind of the thought process was mm-hmm. there. So then when we see a player called back in and they're starting again, it makes us scratch our head of like, well, but we thought they were called in and it didn't work, but now he's yeah. back. And so that I well, think is where some of our consternation comes from with Berhalter. I remember my specific complaint being just that like the players were having to like overthink things mm-hmm. and nothing came naturally because, for example, we didn't have like a pair of center backs who would start start yeah. four games together in a row. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. And and you I, do need that, but then you also to go to the Kuva Arena point, you then want those sort of repetitions in place so that when you play a game not saying this was the case, but if you play a game on a Thursday and you've got to travel to another country to play on a Monday or a Tuesday, you want to know, well, here's my first choice center backs. That one's a little fatigued. I know this is the one who comes in. Now we've got that kind of locked in place yeah. as opposed to there are seven center backs we could choose from. I'm Oof. not sure which it's going to be. And looking back at October 2017, uh-huh. the reason it's so frustrating is that you would have bet money. And I really did feel that Bruce Arena was like sort of the sensible, safe pair of hands who would make the very simple, obvious decisions, Mm -hmm. like not fielding the same 11 who looked tired. Right. You know what I mean? Yes, exactly. Yeah, he would have been the exact coach that you would think would have the experience to know not to do that. That's why it's so hard to Mm -hmm. take. Mm Mm-hmm. (sighs) <sighs> should, I, yeah. we, should we not dwell in October 2017 yeah, anymore? Yeah, I suppose not. Let's, suppose look, not. let's look to the future with Matt Koss. Uh, Matt Koss. I know Matt it was Koss. you, Bruce. I knew it was you. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Koss is the Ernest Hemingway of asking Total Soccer yep. Show questions. This is a three-word question. I love it. Will Messi coach? Mm-hmm. All right. I'm going to say no. That, that is my answer right now. And my reasons for that are, one, like we don't see a lot of Lionel Messi aside from playing for Barcelona – playing for Argentina, and doing commercials. I don't get the impression that he really likes talking about soccer, at least not to the media, at least not in a public setting. I'm sure he enjoys it. He has a soccer field in his backyard. He plays with his dog. Uh, Maybe he'll coach his dog. (laughs) Yes. But there are all the stories that could work. An all-dog 11 coached by Messi, I would pay for that. That's another one I would pay for. Um, Instead of like, roll over, step over, step over. (laughs) Good boy. (laughs) I I don't think about him as a a person who you hear long-form interviews about his thoughts on the development of soccer and tactics. And instead, what I remember the stories being, 
like not when he was breaking out, but like sort of after he'd won a bunch of Champions League was like he would go to training and then he'd go to his brother's house and his sister-in-law would like make them lunch and they would all all, like he wasn't sort of trying to be this next figure in soccer. I think he kind of already is. And I think my guess would be that he will probably retreat a little bit uh, upon retirement still being some sort of immortal member in Barcelona yep. and being a key figure there, but never actually coaching is my guess. So I 99.999% agree with you. The only thing I could see is if he has sort of unfinished business with Argentina yeah, and never managed to win anything with Argentina mm-hmm. and it was a constant failure and he gets to like 40-something years old, there is a chance that like he could think, sort of like Maradona did uh, back in, what, 2010, was mm-hmm. it? Um if he got a chance to coach the national team, it would be like one last chance to have some success with the Albi Celeste. You yeah. know what I'm saying? There might yeah. be just that last roll of the dice. But I do 99.999% agree with you. And then I I feel like he would be an interesting choice yeah. and maybe a more logical one than Diego Maradona. But I also think part of the thing that Diego Maradona struggled with was being such a good player in some ways can make you not as good of a coach. Because yeah. if... At certain points in your career, the game plan was, like, just get it to Diego and he'll do something. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a player like that in your team, it's hard to be like, well, uh, let me find the Diego in this team <laughs> and, like, hope there is one. I've also heard there are coaches like that who just get frustrated. Mm-hmm. I, I genuinely have heard multiple— Thierry Henry was the big one yes! recently. Yeah. And I've heard multiple England players talk about mm-hmm. when Glenn Hoddle was England manager, he would get annoyed that players couldn't do things. Like, there was a story about— um, I don't know if you remember this, in the 1998 World Cup, David Beckham was dropped for the start of the World Cup. And it was because he was asking Beckham in practice to just play this big diagonal ball and like hit, hit the left back, which I think would have been Graham or so at that point. And Beckham, Beckham, Beckham mm. who's so famous for his like on-target passing, yeah. it was off-target all the time. And Hoddle apparently would be in England practice sessions being like, no, do it like this. And he'd literally do it and it would land perfectly because you know Hoddle was this incredible soccer player Mm -hmm. and he'd just be mad that this international footballer couldn't do it so I could see Messi being kind of similar of like yeah we just drop the shoulder and dribble past four people yeah I don't what's what's so hard about this yeah come on just do it (laughs) I mean like I I will say that part of this is me not be like I like Lionel Messi I'm okay with Barcelona but I'm not like a fan of either one yeah so I think maybe if I were a fan I would know more about him personally but I don't again I don't know of many stories of him sort of sitting down and having tactical conversations nor do I know if that's a thing that he's even interested in so then if he were to be a coach my assumption is that he would be in the like Carlo Ancelotti mold as opposed to a Pep Guardiola mold of sort of a like you know what training's gonna be fine we're just gonna play around we're gonna do our own thing like he be a little bit more relaxed yeah. than here are the zones and here's your grid and here's where you have to be but then you have to be here three seconds later like yeah. I don't see him being that coach for I sure feel like we're also getting into an era where soccer players are so well paid I mean yeah. they've always been well paid but True. like That's at this level point. it's yeah. ridiculous right like people like Messi it's multiple hundreds of thousands mm-hmm. of dollars pounds euros a week yeah. there was just no way they will ever need to work again mm-hmm. right whereas Pep Guardiola played at a really high level he wasn't ever on like a gigantic wage no. you know what I'm saying yeah. so not that he needed to work he probably could have saved sensibly and lived a very nice, comfortable life mm-hmm. and probably still have more money than most people will ever have. Yeah. But he couldn't, you know, ball out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Whereas Messi could ball out from now till he's 100 yeah. and not run out of money. I mean, like, and like, even if he did, like, Cruyff was like swindled out of money and that's why he had to keep playing yeah, longer yeah. than he wanted to. Like, even if that, the worst happened to Lionel Messi, he's still Lionel Messi. He will still be a pivotal figure after he dies, after we die. And so with that in mind, if he gets low on funds, instead of having to go out and work like aggressively and coach and go to press conferences and all that, Sign one autograph and he'll do it. a Pepsi ad. <laughs> and it will be like, and a million dollars. He's fine. Like, I think that's how it will go. Kitching. Yep. Pretty much. <laughs> is Pepsi okay? Yes, because Leo Messi says it exactly. is. Exactly. <laughs> Free ad campaign, Pepsi. Pepsi's never okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, today's show is not sponsored by Pepsi. It is sponsored by Manscaped. Yeah, it is. Manscaped is the number one men's below the belt grooming product. Mm-hmm. If you if Manscaped like we appreciate them uh, advertising with us, you get Lionel Messi, then you're good to go. That's what I'm saying. Lionel <laughs> Messi will move your he will move units. Is I yep. guess what I'm saying. But for the purposes of this conversation, we should explain what Manscaped is before I tra- start trying to sell them on Lionel Messi as a sponsor. So Manscaped have a product, the Lawnmower 2.0, mm-hmm. and it chops through hairs like Messi chops through defenders. There we go. And it is also about the same height, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it is clean and painless. It is. Just like Leo Messi. Uh, proprietary skin safe technology, so there's no nicking or snagging. Uh, whereas Lionel Messi gets kicked and snagged a lot and brought down. You're yeah. never going to have to deal with that issue. <laughs> Accidents will mm-hmm. finally be a thing of the past. <laughs> 
<laughs> Even just saying it hurts. It really, it really yeah. does. It makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm I've never to... actually had one of those accidents, but now I feel like I have. From reading this copy so many times mm-hmm. and cringing so many yeah. times, I have like a sense memory as if it's happened to me. <laughs> It really, yeah, just the mere idea of that being an issue makes me uh, really uh, thankful for what Manscaped (laughs) offers because, again, they've got the products to keep things safe and and secure down there but also allow you to to be well-groomed, which is a nice thing. And then, obviously, they've got the other secondary products like the Crop Preserver, which is a deodorant moisturizer. It's got the electrolytes that plants crave. It it does. (laughs) It does indeed. Well said, Daryl. I'm sure they'll love that one. (laughs) That's definitely in the copy. Um, (laughs) But, yeah, so you can, like, keep things groomed but then think keep things like moisturized and smelling yeah. nice and smelling nice yes. is important don't be that guy that doesn't smell nice down there please don't uh, please uh, don't please uh, don't you can get 20 percent off plus free shipping if you go to manscaped.com and use the code tss mm-hmm. that will make sure that you have the right tools for the job mm-hmm. and your things down there will thank you your things down there will thank you that's right so again 20 percent off using the code TSS. Uh, at manscaped.com. 20% off at manscaped.com with the code. Plus free shipping. With TSS. Don't miss out the free shipping <laughs> with the code TSS. There yes. we go. 20% off and free shipping. TSS at manscaped.com. There we go. Thank yeah. you very much to Manscaped for sponsoring today's episode. Daryl, next question comes from Joey Jedlowski. Oh, yeah? What are some ways What's the know? FIFA rankings could be reformed or replaced so that they would be more accurate reflections of which national teams are truly better than others? Joey's sort of background to this question was essentially that no one really seems to give the FIFA rankings too much credit. Everyone complains about them, right? Yeah, but then there's nothing else really that exists, so no one ever complains and then says, here's my solution. It's yep. more of a, these don't work, and these don't work, let's move on. I've got some news for everybody. Mm-hmm. They did update how they do the there FIFA ramp- rankings in 2018. Yeah. And I think it was actually a pretty smart update. It was more modeled after the ELO rankings, mm-hmm. which I think I think is like how they do chess rankings. And there's also like this rival world soccer rankings that were unofficial, but they just did it anyway. Bobby uh, Fischer. Bobby Fischer? Gary Kasparov. Are that you just naming chess players? That's all I know. <laughs> that's number one and that, two. Those are my rankings. Yeah, that's I'm sure those are still the top Deep two guys. Deep blue is number three. <laughs> But coming up fast. Uh-huh. Coming up fast. <laughs> D'Angelo Barksdale, number four. My MacBook is number seven million. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Those are my top four chess players. It's two world champions, yeah. two grandmasters, a computer, and D'Angelo Barksdale. Kasparov is now more of a, a political, mm-hmm. an outspoken political person, Yes, right? he is. Yeah. Yes. D'Angelo Barksdale. You know what? He's number one now. That's he's it. number one. All right. Yeah. Go on, Gary. There go, we go on, Gary. Um, anyway, mm-hmm. in September 2018, FIFA did update the ranking. So it now essentially works... Um, there's the uh, amount of points you get, which is based on the importance of the match, like less for a friendly, more for like a, an official qualifier or FIFA competition. Um, and then it's also based on the expected result of the match, meaning essentially if a lower ranked team beats a higher ranked team, um, then they get more points for beating a higher ranked team. Right. And then you. OK. Yeah. It's, hey, I did a pretty good job of explaining <laughs> you that. Really did. You, you really should see, did. You should see the longer version. It's algebra. It's literally algebra. Just push your glasses up, you nerd. I no, can't. But, They're all the way up. But I, 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 I say so that. It's, it's been updated. Yeah. No one noticed mm-hmm. because everyone still wants to complain that because it's like this. It's this old saw that the yeah. FIFA rankings are terrible. Right? Yeah. Everybody says it. Everybody still thinks it's true. It might be true, but I think they're better than they, than they were. It, it's. The, really, the, the snoring was to emphasize the like, dual problem. The lack of respect. Obviously, yes. But it's the <laughs> dual problem of the FIFA rankings, which is that it is relatively complex math combined with a global system of rankings that puts every national team into a rank from FIFA, who is not like the most trusted organization, and it's yeah. sponsored as well. So like, I think those things combine to make it feel like it's a sort of like... Like it feels too corporate-y, it feels too like clean, but then there's math behind it. I yeah. don't really – let's just uh, – Germany's the best. Like and that's to, what <laughs> tends to happen, I feel like. And to Joey's question, in terms mm-hmm. of a mathematical system, I think it's actually impossible to yeah. perfect it because soccer is just so crazy and random and things can change so quickly. Like you could have like um, a couple years' worth of points accumulated mm-hmm. um, and then like your very best player who's like carrying your team – gets injured and can't play ever again and suddenly you're a much worse team right. there's no way the rankings can reflect that mm-hmm. right it's very hard for numbers to reflect the the reality of what happens on a soccer field mm-hmm. so my actual answer for this to, to joe's question is instead of having like a mathematical system the, the way to improve them i don't think this is really possible but the way to improve them would be to have like a panel of world soccer experts 
Um, and they're almost like the precogs from Minority Report where they're just like locked in a room and this is their only job. And they have to watch every soccer match in the whole world mm. and then debate for hours about what the rankings are of the various teams. Right. You'd have to have a group of people dedicated to being experts in knowing which national teams are better than other national teams and then they can do it. Yes. And those Sponsored people, by Pepsi. And those people would have <laughs> to care a lot. And there certainly be, are people that do. I'm assuming Joey is one of them. But – Like, aside from assigning, like, pots and rankings and that sort of order, the other thing for me is, like, do they really matter? Like, like, and I know they do, but for me personally— They do because it decides if you get in the hex and what what pot you're in and all that for World Cup, yeah. But, but like, I think—but part of it is that from a conversational standpoint, like, the FIFA rankings, whenever you hear them discussed, it's usually as a— Yeah, they're, like, the number 12 team in the world right now. I mean, those are the FIFA rankings, so great as all. But if they're the number 12—like, that tends to be how it's discussed. Aside from, like, what they're actually intended for, which is maybe a separate conversation about how you could fine-tune that a little bit. Like, for for draws for tournaments and stuff, which is the thing I think that is— happening whenever you're using a giant list of like this thing says that this team is the fifth best team in the world usually i feel like you're using that in like a debate setting or for purposes yeah. of like giving background around a team and that doesn't really help explain who the team is or how they play or what they do so it ends up being this sort of thing that you use as a like well they're the fifth best team in the world and it doesn't really mean that much so but what do you think of my idea of making it a more uh subjective list of rankings where people are actually instead of a mathematical system people are tasked with watching the games and deciding who's best like isn't that i mean i feel like atlanta united is going to end up being number one that's how that, that all that national works, right? isn't that <laughs> how that works no matter what the polling is and the voting is and the system is in place atlanta united wins it'll I be think. like brazil germany atlanta yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> Seattle up there too, I think. <laughs> but could, could that work? Or isn't mm-hmm. college football done on a sort of ranking voting system? Yeah. Like, could it be like something like that? Yeah, I think so. It, like, Maybe national team coaches can vote on like uh, which teams are the best. That would, that would be really fun because I always enjoy when you see the bitterness of like when you do the Ballon d'Or and it's the it's like what like the the coach, the captain, and the media all get one vote. Yeah. And I just always enjoy seeing the, like, Brazil refusing to vote for Messi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, those types of things. So I would enjoy all of the pettiness that would factor into that. Although you would probably end up getting some biased votes, and yeah. then you'd get match-fixing and bribery and all that good stuff. So, yeah, so it. team representatives voting is a yeah. terrible idea because, one, there's no guarantee that they even care enough mm-hmm. to watch certain teams, and, two, there's going to be a lot of biases, right? Like, uh, the Scottish vote is not ever going to go to Harry Kane. I would just love <laughs> seeing John Terry unpack like a like back when he was captain of england just getting a packet of papers of like i have to rank how many teams like what's this now like i guess togo are better than the maldives i don't know <laughs> like <laughs> so that, yeah that's why you'd have to have the idea of the like dedicated precog type experts. no disrespect to togo no disrespect to togo yeah i mean john Terry Emmanuel might, i would might never. enjoy watching them, i would yeah. never uh. <laughs> uh, but yeah i like i like your idea overall because i think like, for the purposes of what, like, the FIFA rankings are, they're either a way to rank teams in order, like, for them to be in certain competitions or where they're going to be in those competitions. That's a separate one. Other than that, it feels like they're used for, like, debate and conversational purposes, yeah. which is already subjective. So then I think your work, yours works better there. There we go. Mm-hmm. And it should just be a series of podcasts every day yeah. that gets released arguing about which national team ranks where. Spin-off show? Yeah. <laughs> Sponsored by Pepsi. There we go. <laughs> um, final question mm-hmm. comes from Luke Carey. Yeah. Um, why not do a combined CONCACAF and CONMEBOL Nations League? Mm-hmm. And if you did, how would you organize it? So for those who don't know, CONCACAF Nations League, it's what the US are playing in and recently losing to Canada in. Um, right now, it, it features all the right. CONCACAF teams. UEFA also has a Nations League, which recently completed, I believe, Portugal won it. Mm-hmm. Um, CONMEBOL only has 10 teams right. and does not have a Nations League system. Right. So, so why not combine them? I I think this would solve a lot of problems. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be I think it would be great. The answer, my number one answer for why they won't do it is money. It, that's what it kind of comes down to in my mind is the idea that like you're going to have to figure out the tournament structure, but then you have to work like Concacaf has to work with Common Bowl, has to work with Concacaf, and you always have that sort of hesitation of the two confederations to get together. We saw it in the Copa America Centenario, and it required a lot of guarantees about revenue sharing and who would get yeah, what and when. There is that, and so that's a big part of it. Is I think that they like Concacaf is probably wants to ensure that their nations get money. So Bermuda playing Mexico 
is going to get they are money. In the, in the yeah, group right now, they're yeah. going to get some money that they wouldn't otherwise get if Bermuda doesn't get to play Mexico because they're playing stronger South American opposition. Then Bermuda is sort of in the same place it was before this even got established. Is there an argument that it definitely would be to the benefit of at least the big teams in Concacaf? Like the, it would be to the U.S. men's national team's benefit and Mexico's benefit to have a Concacaf Conmebol Nations League because then in this spell instead of playing Bermuda mm-hmm. as Mexico have to and the U.S. playing Cuba in League A in the top league, you instead could end up in a group with like Brazil and Venezuela or Uruguay or Argentina or something like that. And you would get that thing of having um, consistent, uh, meaningful competition against really, really, really good teams. If we had beaten Canada... It would be halfway towards merging the confederations without actually having to do it. My honest answer is if we had beaten Canada, I would say no to your question because I would argue that like, but you, if you're the US and you're trying to implement a new system, you play some smaller teams, you kind of get that system underway a little bit, you figure it out, then you play a team like Canada... And that helps you sort of take that, play it against stronger opposition. You tweak it a little bit, you get better. You beat Canada, and you keep moving up. That that did not happen. I'm like, well, sure, <laughs> let's just <laughs> let's play stronger teams, and maybe that forces us to be like, all right, you know what? Pragmatism. We're sitting back and counterattacking oh, now. But maybe that's the mm-hmm. reason to do. That's it. what I'm saying. And wouldn't you enjoy it more if the U.S. like had meaningful games against? Oh yeah, Brazil that's what I'm saying. Yes, points? now. Yes, now. I, w- I would have said no had we've beaten Canada. Basically, <laughs> so that's how fickle my opinions are. You want an easy life, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> And I also think if Conmebol can't yeah. do a Nations League, right? There's just not – there's not – I mean, they could go into like maybe three tiers. Yeah. Like a, a group of three, a group yeah, of three, exactly. and a group, a group of four. Of four. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it's it's just too small, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, congratulations to Brazil and Argentina for constantly being there. And then, I guess, one of Colombia, Uruguay, Chile? Yeah, we just keep getting relegated and promoted between uh, – there'll be a yo-yo team between yeah. League A and League B. Making sure I haven't forgotten anybody massive yeah. so we're not going to hear I mean, about it. Obviously Bolivia. Um, obviously Bolivia. <laughs> Um, so, okay, if we were to do this, mm-hmm. and I am all about this, I would love for this to happen, how would we organize it? Uh, I assume you just take the current CONCACAF Nations League mm-hmm. and like insert the CONMEBOL teams into it, right? So that teams like Bermuda drop out of the top league and bigger, the big uh, South American teams come in. Yeah, that, that's probably it, I guess. And then you Based have, on FIFA World Rankings. There we go. I mean, but there is a potential argument that there are some CONCACAF teams who are ranked higher than some Commonwealth teams, just because Bolivia, Venezuela, I'm going to assume, are further back in that order than, say, Costa Rica, as an example. We so don't know that looking. We do don't it. really know. That, but, that, but why not just take the FIFA World Rankings, mm-hmm. as they currently are, flawed as they may be, yeah. right? And you take the top um, 12 teams, mm-hmm. and you have a League A with four groups of three yeah. of the top the top ranked teams. I think that maybe that's the other issue. Is like, hold on, say that one more time. I just want to make sure I get you, this. You take the current FIFA World Rankings, You're right? Uh, and then you pick out the top twelve ranked Concacaf and Conmebol teams, right? And that's your League A, right? That's then uh, four groups of three teams each. That's League A. I think the other issue there that you're going to run into really fast is even with what I've just said, I still think that's going to end up being at best three, maybe four Concacaf teams yeah. and eight Conmebol. And yeah. so then for those two common Yeah, it would essentially be the U.S. and Mexico mixed in with like Chile, Uruguay, Colombia, right. Brazil, Argentina, and so on. But then essentially all you're doing is taking the couple of like like next tier, I say Mexico and then some other teams, and making that and like letting them play better teams. But you're kind of removing them, the money makers, from the equation if you're Concacaf, and then you're having like Venezuela or Bolivia play. Jamaica, yeah, I don't know if that's going to make. Game. Yeah, I think, but at the end, it comes down to money, and that's always going to be the issue. That's what I keep going back to. So I still want it to happen. I just don't know how you do it in a way that financially satisfies all parties, so that it could actually happen. I mean, if you could, so one big thing is if you could sell this combi- combined Concacaf Conmebol Nations League, mm-hmm. if you could sell it for a big TV contract, yeah, then then the money starts to flow, that makes right? Sense. Mm-hmm. To the bigger teams. It right. depends how much... I think the bigger teams would have to try and sell this thing for as much as possible and then promise to share that revenue with the League B, C, D mm-hmm. teams, right? So then Bermuda might not get the gate money for when they get to host Mexico yeah. in a competitive game, but they might get the trickle-down TV money uh, from this big sale. Yeah. So you need a really good salesman, You would, and you would need I feel that. like I'm the man for the job. I, I think you are. But <laughs> My because... enthusiasm would push it over the line. <laughs> but the other issue and the reason why you're going to need very good salespeople is because you've got Brazil and Argentina who both use a lot of their international dates to yeah. go 
yeah. play in international places. They'll play random friendlies. Like in what, Qatar, Brazil, in London? Yeah, in, Brazil played Niger in like Singapore, I think, yeah. the last break. And so they use that to make money. And we assume someone at Singapore pays them money to come and play. Yes, right? I yeah. doubt they're just doing that out of the goodness yeah. of their own hearts. Uh, yeah. Same thing with Qatar when they go there or the uh-huh. UAE when they go there. So I think you There's then, a sporting argument for it though, right? That it's better for the Brazilian players to be playing competitive games for points mm-hmm. than it is to be playing friendlies in Singapore. Right. Yeah. You could make that argument and then you would have to put like actual <laughs> like bags of cash on the table yeah. and be like, oh, and there's this too. I yep. think that's how you would persuade uh, Brazil and Argentina to maybe buy into the, the combined Nations League as opposed to selling their own friendlies. You know what I do? I do exactly that. Okay. But the bags I put on the table, not, I, not really full of cash. Uh-huh. Dirty undies. <laughs> Just like John Goodman. Yeah. That worked out great. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of did. It was kind of okay. It was fine. <laughs> so there we go. We have a plan. We believe Brilliant. in nothing, Lebowski. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be the nihilist CONCACAF Nations League. <laughs> the nihilist <laughs> Nations League. It's about where most US fans are, are, are already, so <laughs> why not? Yeah. We'd win it every year. Yeah, we would. <laughs> All right, so I'm glad we've established Lamb and the Nihilism League. Yep. Perfect. The Nihilist Nations League. <laughs> I did realize after we came up with Lamb, the problem would be that given branding and perception, you couldn't call it Lower League because they wouldn't want to be called Lower League. Yeah, yeah. It would have to be something else. I, I don't know what that would be. Other, but I'm, I'm Other sti- League. I'm still sticking with Lamb because it's the best equally one. good league. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that one doesn't quite flow off the tongue so much. <laughs> um, so hopefully we have given some decent enough answers to those listener questions. Yeah, we think- I'd say 50-50. I'm all right with it. Uh, we <laughs> thank everyone for submitting those questions. We also thank everyone. Go ahead, Daryl. I was going to say, if you've got a question to submit, um, please send it to totalsoccershow.com slash questions. We're always looking for good questions to answer. I'll allow it. I'll yeah, allow thank it. You. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes, we are. And we appreciate all the ones we do get, especially because there are some in there that, like, we were both sort of, when we saw them for the first time, we were just like, no. Like, isn't that the <laughs> answer? But then it makes you think about it. You have to kind of approach yes. it differently, and it helps yeah. you figure some things out in but the But sometimes end. the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is no. <laughs> um, and we also appreciate everyone who sends us scouting reports. Obviously, we have many wonderful people scouting many wonderful players and some not-so-wonderful players around <laughs> the planet. Uh, what starting- are you thinking of? Uh, I mean, like, we've had a few Name people names. be like, uh, this player is no longer playing professional oh, soccer actually. anymore. Uh, you know, I don't think we have any murderers in the scouting network. <laughs> I hope not. That's a different scouting network for probably last podcast on the left. Oh, OK. Um, Adam Yesaman scouting Matthew Hop. Hoppy? Hope? Something like I that. I don't know. I don't H-O-P-P-E. Know. I'm going to say Hoppy. Uh, 18-year-old American striker for Schalke. I was not familiar with Matthew Hoppy. Hop. Hip. From what I remember, I, I put him in the scouting network because he was scoring some goals for Schalke's youth team. How would you go? Would you go Hoppy? I just go hop. Okay. I have no justification for it. I just would. I like it. Matthew yeah. Hop scored two goals for Schalke U19s against Ingolstadt as part of a 3 0 victory in the U19 DFB Pokal, and then started for Schalke's U19s against Giorena and the Dortmund U19 squad over the weekend. He did not figure into the scoring, but was part of an impressive 4 0 win in that rivalry game. Yeah. That rivalry game for the senior level happening this weekend. Yep, the Paul, about that one. The Paul Revere Derby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well done, sir. Uh, young Mr. <laughs> Hoppy. Thank you. Uh, has established himself as a regular starter and goal scorer for the U19 team thus far this season. I think you changed your pronunciation. I did. He's All a happy right. bunny. There we um, go. Eric Edston is mm-hmm. scouting Callum hudson Adoy, the 18-year-old English winger for Chelsea. Eric says Callum officially signed his new five-year contract with Chelsea in late September. Since then, he's returned to the first team as featured in three straight games in the Premier League and two in the Champions League, all of which were wins. Here is why I need more scouting reports from Eric about Callum, because... Keen, keen-eared listeners will know I genuinely have moments of indecision of if it's Callum or Callum. I don't know why, but I, I treat it the same way I treat treat if I don't know if it's Kirk or Kurt as a first name. Yeah. I should be like Kurt. I've just been like Callum Hudson Adoy is usually what I've done. So now I know Callum. I can dial down that paranoia a little bit. So thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. We can all breathe a sigh of relief. We can. Uh, Drew Trammell, aka Drake von Truens, <laughs> scouting Martin Odegaard, the 20-year-old Norwegian uh, midfielder attacker on loan at Sociedad from Madrid. Odegaard has been having a strong season in Spain since scoring the lone goal in a one-no win over Mallorca in August. He's made a total of nine appearances, scoring two goals. Odegaard has also been a regular contributor for the Norwegian 
Norwegian team in their unsuccessful quest to auto-qualify for the Euros, for the 2020 Euros. However, they're still assured of at least the playoffs due to their performance in the Nations League. That confused me a lot. Do you get it now? Do you know how it works? Well, it was only because they're they're fourth in the table. Yeah. And and yet it still has like the little mark next to them that says guaranteed playoffs. Mm-hmm. I was like, how did they buy their way in? How do they guarantee that? Do they know they're going to win their remaining games? <laughs> then it made more sense. Yeah, Nations League, you get that second chance. Which is the cool thing about the European Nations League. Yep. Uh, maybe if we could do the, uh, the Nihilist Nations mm-hmm. League. <laughs> <laughs> the U.S. could always do the second chance to qualify for the World Cup, it turns out. Perfect. Kaz Tidrick is scouting Robbie Mertz, the 22-year-old American midfielder for the Pittsburgh River Hounds. Kaz says Robbie subbed on early in the second half of the Hounds' 1-0 victory away at Birmingham. It's probably not how you pronounce that. Birmingham. Yeah. Um, in which the Pittsburgh uh, River Hounds clinched the first place in the USL Championship's Eastern Conference. Yeah, I think you do have to say the ham yeah. to, make, to make it the proper Southern. So, yes. Yep. Well done, sir. Damon Chieso scouting Harvey Elliott, the 16-year-old English midfielder for Liverpool. Elliott played well and earned an assist in Liverpool's win over Genk, not Ghent, in the UEFA Youth League game I on saw Wednesday. that story. Yep. Some Liverpool fans went to Ghent. Yes, they oh, did. No. Did you feel better about that one? I mean, no, I felt bad that they made the same mistake. Yeah. And I felt like that could have been me. <laughs> my my Liverpool supporting friend Trey wants to pitch a like dumb and dumber idea about two <laughs> Liverpool fans who just do stuff like that and keep getting like lost and sidetracked and waylaid in different cities and I'm all for it. But they go to Salzburg for the Red Bull game. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I I do I did that once accidentally. I was looking at the RB Sal- Salzburg team for, against Liverpool, and I was yeah. like, like Tyler Adams didn't even make the bench. And then I had that moment of like, oh right, 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 right. I see what's happened here. I see what's happened here. Uh, anyway, in the 73rd minute of that UEFA Youth League game against Genk, uh, Elliot cut inside from the right wing and beautifully lofted a 15 yard pass to the feet of Curtis Jones, Curtis Jones, who brought it under control just inside the six yard box and nutmegged goalie Martin Vandervoort uh, at the near post to go up two 0 Curtis Jones also in the scouting network, mm-hmm. but I don't think we're getting reports right now. It's a very <clears> subtle <throat> hint to whoever is scouting Curtis Jones. Is the one on him later on? Yeah. No, no, I'm just clearing my throat as a reminder to the person scouting Curtis Jones. Oh, I see. Jones. All yeah. right. I thought maybe I hadn't read ahead. Naming no names, but you, person who's not scouting <laughs> Curtis Jones. <laughs> Joseph Meadows is scouting Azrael Gonzalez, the Mm. 18-year-old American midfielder for the Tacoma Defiance. Um, Azrael has had a very exciting week. Against New Mexico United, he ran into open space behind the defense and put his defender on skates to open enough space to get a tight goal from a tight angle in the seventh minute. He followed that up with a goal against the Austin Bold on a low cross from the right after making a late run for midfield in the 21st minute. All right, Azrael. You and I spend a lot of time together. I'm just curious, that little chuckle there, was that you picturing a person actually wearing skates on a soccer field? Because I feel like it was. Yes. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I had hoped it was. Axel Romain. I was also weirdly picturing uh, Jason Lee in Dogma because I think he plays a character called Azrael. Oh, he does. I was having like random flashbacks to Dogma. That is, yeah. I think that's him. I think that's the demon he plays. Yeah, yeah. But I was trying really hard to focus on what I was doing. <laughs> well done, sir. Well, lot, a lot going on in that Daryl Grove brain today. Uh, Axel Romain scouting Nathaniel Chalaba, the 24-year-old English midfielder for Watford. Now picturing Romain Lettuce. I, you should be. That, that's his favorite lettuce. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that or not. That's, that's a big thing of his uh, profile. Chalaba got his first start of the season and played all 90 in a one-to-one tie against Tottenham last weekend. There's a 100% chance that Ke- uh, Harry Kane's favorite lettuce is Iceberg. Just saying. Uh, he played in front of the center backs as a deep central defensive midfielder in a 5-3-2. Uh, defensively, he looked very strong, stopping the Tottenham attacks before they entered the 18. He did struggle going forward and wasn't as effective in facilitating Watford's counterattacking system. Well, that's true for the whole team right now. That right? is also true. <laughs> Alex Cost is scouting Karamoko Dembele, the 16-year-old English forward for Celtic. Do you remember this teenager made mm-hmm. his debut for Celtic last season? English for now, I should add. Okay. Alex says, it seems that Karamoko Dembele sweepstakes have taken yet another turn. After previously representing the England U15s, Scotland U16s and Scotland U17s, Karamoko made his England U17 debut over the international break, playing in a 3-3 draw against Germany and scoring England's only goal in a 1-1 draw with Spain. Mm-hmm. That's good news. It is. Yeah. He he's, he's seems to have chosen you all for now. We yeah. shall see. He seems like one of those guys at like the indoor facility here in Richmond who just sticks around after his game to see yeah. if the next team might need a player or two. <laughs> He's just showing up for youth national teams and seeing what happens. He's sitting on Hadrian's fence. Exactly. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you. Bravo. Well done, sir.
Well done. Brighton Castle final report scouting Lee Kang-in, the 18-year-old Korean midfielder for Valencia. Uh, Lee got his first start, uh, league start on the left wing and was involved in all three of Valencia's goals in a 3-3 draw with Hitafe in late September. Since then, he's made a total of five appearances in the league, only one of which was a start. He's also scored one goal, which isn't too bad for a youngster who has been with Valencia for quite some time, but bouncing back and forth between Valencia and Valencia 2 seems like he cemented his spot in the first team this season. All right, well, thank Thank you to Adam, Eric, Drew, Kaz, Damon, Joseph, Axel, Alex, and Brighton for today's scouting reports. We very much enjoyed them, and Taylor agrees. I agree with that too. Uh, what else we got on today's show? Really just a trailer for tomorrow's show. Yes. Uh, tomorrow we will be back to review all the MLS conference semi-final games. Well done, sir. I'm, I'm getting there, right? Mm-hmm. It's the quarterfinals. It's the really. quarterfinals. The MLS Cup quarterfinals yeah. uh, with Joe Lowry. Thank you to everybody for your show title, Joe Larry MLS show title suggestions. We got some really good ones and we're thinking them over. There are mm-hmm. some that we like. There are. There are some we don't like, but there are some that we like. We, we need like an elaborate system of unveiling the top 10. Maybe yeah. Letterman style. We have to have a, a <laughs> random celebrity on to read them out and find a way to do it comedically. Let's get David Letterman. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah he's not busy. He's not busy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Taylor Rockwell, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Right back at you, buddy. And if you need another podcast to listen to uh, and you're looking for some soccer content, worth noting, I believe the podcast JD and the Rod, uh, their inaugural secondary round of episodes, I guess is the best way to put this one. Uh, Their first uh, proper episode right, with go. call-ins and everything, mm-hmm. I believe is now available as a podcast. Actually, I genuinely subscribed uh, about two hours before we started recording. I'm going to listen to it later. See, Daryl's going to, and if you want to as gonna, well, then you should subscribe too. And I'm going to judge it. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, sure. gonna, I'm just going to listen and, and wag enjoy. your finger at your phone. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, listeners, thank you so much. We will talk to you again tomorrow. Tomorrow.